All right, everyone get a seat. People are walking in. There are chairs up here in the front. If you're looking for seats, there's some, I think, some seats there in the middle. Get everyone settled. As we conclude our small group, our community group series on gleanings of the desert. Gleanings of the desert. I hope you guys have been enjoying the wisdom that is coming out of the desert that we are learning from their... It's not coming up for some reason under the list. All right, there are, like I said, there are some chairs over here in the front right. There's some over here. Maybe you can move those muffin things or whatever and make some space for people. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you can, they're all yours now. Go ahead. That's fine. All right. No, I'll, 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 I'll. If we can squeeze in just because it's a little bit crowded in here, if you can squeeze in if there's open spots or leave some open spots so people are not walking in between the middle of the aisles um, to find seats. There's some seats up here in the front. We can move those pens and papers over here in the front. We can, don't mind me. Don't mind me. <laughs> Thanks for your help. <laughs> All right, there are some chairs over there in the front. Welcome. We've got a crowded, we've got a crowded room this morning. Welcome, everyone. All right. Unfortunately. Looking for some seats, I think, for people. All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. So I'm just going to... Welcome, everyone, to our fourth week. A lot of people have been telling me that this is, uh, this series has been hitting home and addressing, people keep on saying, why do you keep talking about me, Abuna? Why do you keep talking about... Because, like we said in the beginning, is that what we're talking about the Desert Fathers is that our spiritual life is a lot more than I say some prayers, I read the Bible, I take communion, do some confession, and that's it. The Desert Fathers really battled and struggled against a lot within themselves in order that they might be right with God, that they might be not just right with God, like in good standings with God, but that they might be one with God, united to God. And this is our whole goal in the spiritual life, that we would be drawn closer to the Lord. And the first week we talked about the thoughts. I think there's nobody that is not battled by some aspect of thoughts, negative thinking, sinful thinking, um, all types of thinking that brings us down and makes us feel often defeated because of the mind and what's going on in the mind. The week after that, we spoke about judging and how we need to refuse to judge our neighbor and how that is really um, something that maybe a lot of us are battling with as I go around to the different uh, community groups everybody's saying that's me that's me and this is how I feel this is how I need to, to to work on some of these battles that are within me last week Abuna Elijah spoke to us about the tongue and the sins of the tongue and the damage and the great power the tongue has for good and for bad and this week, we're going to be speaking about anger. Anger. Anger is the most misunderstood, and by the way, the most misapplied emotion of all the emotions that we have as human beings. And anger is not necessarily a sin, believe it or not. A lot of people think anger is a sin, but it's not necessarily. We know that we read throughout the Old Testament, the Lord was aroused in his anger. We see even the Lord demonstrating anger. The anger is not the same anger maybe that you and I deal with, but the way that the Lord dealt with his anger, we see it in the temple. We can't deny the Lord was angry. He was angry at what was taking place. It wasn't like he was, you know, casually just like lifting over tables. He was flipping tables. 
He was angry at what was taking place in the temple of God. So anger is an emotion that God has. Not that God has emotions, but something that God has expressed in the word of God. And so we also can be angry. We can understand what anger does. Let's look at what Ava Evagrius, the monk, says. Anger is by nature designed for waging war with the demons and for struggling with every kind of sinful pleasure. Therefore, angels arousing spiritual pleasure in us and giving us to taste its blessedness incline us to direct our anger against the demons. So it's okay to have anger, but you have to figure out where you are directing your anger. And this is the whole concept of having this spiritual mindset and that I'm not just, you know, not going to be angry. But there is a healthy way to direct my anger in a way that is pleasing before God. But the demons enticing us towards worldly lusts make us use anger to fight with men, which is against nature. Once again, the church fathers are teaching us, the fathers of the desert tell us that it is not within your nature to fight against men. It is to fight against demons. It is to fight, and even we talked about a couple weeks ago when, when we were speaking about judgment, that sometimes you look at your brother who might be annoying you or a difficult person, and you have to look and say, it is the evil that is driving them down this path. So that the mind, thus stupefied and darkened, should become a traitor to virtues. Something you should understand is that the opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is apathy. So you look on your handouts and you have a pen, you guys can use these for your community group discussions. But the opposite of anger, okay, isn't you think, okay, the opposite of love is being angry. That's not true. The opposite of love is not caring. Apathy is somebody, somebody who's apathetic, doesn't care, is passive. God doesn't want us to be passive. You should not look at injustices in the world, persecutions among people, um, people who are suffering and afflicted by, by very, very dark things and feel like, no, 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 I'm not going to get angry. No, you're not a human if you don't get angry. You have to get angry. But where do you direct your anger? And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But what's important is to understand, managed anger is actually the good thing. It produces good marriages. When you have managed anger, you, you learn to fix things within your marriages, within your family life, in your relationships. It produces good leadership and good churches. Knowing how to put a anger in its proper place. Nowadays, society is like the society, it's just an age of rage. Everybody, you know, you, if you drive in, in, in D.C., downtown D.C., where it's very, very crowded in traffic, everybody's honking. And if you've been to New York or Cairo, right, is that everybody has some type of rage in everything. And so everybody's walking on eggshells because everybody's got this issue with them. But nobody taught us in our society how to manage our anger. And so, believe it or not, you've been learning how to deal with your anger like the world does, right? If you're angry, that's what the horn is there for. You, you honk at people, right? That's what your fingers are there for. Like, that's what we think. Like, I'm going to use my finger to insult somebody. That's not what anger is meant to be used for. We've got to be able to understand what I'm going to do with that. We typically go from one extreme to the other. Just because you're not vocal about your anger doesn't mean that you're not angry, right? You have the maniac person that yells. We, we know those people, but we have those people in our lives that, that any type of angry feeling that comes, they just blurt it out or they fight or they scream or they're yelling all the time. Those people have anger and it's obvious. But there's also people who are quiet and don't say anything, but they have a lot of anger, right? They have a, and so they shut down or they put a guard over themselves. Typically, these two extremes... Or some people just clam up when they get angry and other people blow up when they get angry. We want to understand how we're supposed to deal with our anger. Let me give you a few little facts about anger that you may not know. For instance, the average woman, I read these uh, statistics, loses her temper three times a week. <laughs> that didn't say Egyptian woman, it just said woman. Okay. <laughs> the average woman, okay, the average woman loses her temper three times a week while the average man loses his temper about six times a week. 
Women get more often angry at people, while men more often get angry at things. Okay? That's why they're, they're cursing at their cars and they're doing all kinds of stuff like that. Single adults express... So it just said women and men, but now it's going to... Single adults express anger twice as often as married adults. Men are far more physical in their anger than women. You are more likely to express anger at home than anywhere else. That's obvious, all right? Now, successful relationships and successful marriages and friendships are not those marriages that don't have anger. Because you're thinking, okay, well, we have anger in our, in our home, right? There's a lot of angry, anger going on. And so I think I could never be successful in these friendships or marriages or, or parental relationships. There's a lot of anger going on. But it's not people who don't have it, but it's rather it's when they've learned how to manage it, how to direct your anger in a way that is pleasing to God. So God gives us very specific principles on which we're going to build the proper use of anger. So the first one, how do we tame my temper? How do we temp tame our temper? We need to lower the anger level within our society. And so there's six things that we're going to talk about. The first thing God says to do if you want to tame your temper is you must resolve to manage it. You must resolve to manage it. You have to quit saying, I can't control it. This is just me. Some people tell me, you know, Abuna, this is just how I talk. This is just how I am. Maybe you know, you know, you, you've met somebody like that and you probably know who I'm talking about. Like some people say, this is how I am. Just take it how I am. No, you can control it. And the Bible makes it very clear that we can control it. Proverbs 16.32 says this, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Once again, Proverbs 16.32, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. And this was the purpose of the desert. Why the monks went to the desert is to rule their spirit, to know what is inside of me, why I do the, the things that I do. Why do we tell people to go to counseling, to therapy? It's for somebody to process with you why I do what I do, why I'm projecting my anger in this way, why I'm insecure, why I flee whenever there's a fight. And that's what therapy does. It helps you discover so that I can rule over my spirit, not let my spirit get out of control. In fact, you have to understand that anger is a choice and you choose it or you don't choose it. Either you choose to be anger, angry or you don't choose to be angry. You have far more control over your anger than, than you want to admit how many times you're in the middle screaming at somebody in the house and all of a sudden you get a phone call, you know, you get a phone call and you're like, hey, how are you? You were just going to kill your three-year-old five seconds ago, okay? But like you get, hey, how's it going? Long time no see. What happened? You controlled your anger. You shut it off just like this. You responded or you're angry and, you're about, and your, your boss walks and you say, yes, sir, what can I do for you? You can control your anger and you can shut it down just like this. Proverbs 29.11 says this. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Make sure you, you stress this, holds them back part, underline it. Holds means it's a choice, it's a responsibility. When I get angry, I'm choosing to get angry and I'm not blaming anyone else. When I say manage your anger, what I'm saying is it means you make a choice in advance. You go into a room, you go into a meeting and you say, I'm not going to get angry. You know that before you get home, you know that, you know, your, your parents did whatever, or your spouse did something, your kids. You go and you say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to Speak to them with a gentle voice. I'm going to not demonstrate my anger in a way that could be displeasing to God. As we get further, we're going to talk about that. Because if you don't do that, if you wait till your blood pressure is rising, your adrenaline is shooting through the roof, you've already lost the battle at that point. 
If you don't make a plan on how you're going to address the conflict in your life, chances are you've already lost the battle. Listen to this. Beautiful saying, Ava Isidor the priest. A brother asked Ava Isidor the priest, why are the demons so frightened of you? Pay attention to this. Why are the demons so frightened? Wouldn't you want to know the answer to that? He says, the old man said to him, because ever since the day I began practicing ascesis, or ascesis is like my spiritual struggle in the desert, I have striven to prevent anger from reaching my lips. Imagine the demons are afraid of him. The demons avoid him because I have worked on not allowing my anger to come out of my mouth. That I know exactly how to deal with it. And something you have to understand is there is always a cost to your anger. If you look at your hand, there's always a cost. You have to remember the cost and the price that has to be paid sometimes for your anger. Listen to what Ava Agathon says. If a man is enslaved by anger, then even if he were to raise the dead, listen to this, even if he were to raise the dead, he would not be acceptable to God by virtue of his bondage to the passion of anger. When you think of a person that could raise the dead by their prayers, and we talked about this in judging as well, that a person who knows their own sinfulness is better in the eyes of God than a person that can raise the dead by their prayers. So the desert has taught us so many more secrets that understanding there is a cost. I could lose my connection with God. When you understand that there is a price tag to your anger, It'll make you process your anger in a much healthy way. And I want you to think about some of these costs that you've incurred because of your anger. What, have, what has hurt different relationships that you have? Let's look at Proverbs 29, 22. An angry person stirs up conflict and a hot-tempered person commits many sins. You can go on and on about the many sins, all kinds of sins. An angry person stirs up conflict. If you're always wondering why you have conflict with everyone, with your friends, with your, your, your parents, with your spouse, with your co-workers, chances are the root of it is you're an angry person. A hot-tempered person does all kinds of sins, and it just gives birth to other sins. You say, you know what, Buna, that's just me. People around me understand. Be careful if you're the one at home that is causing everyone else to sin. Everyone is, is, is miserable. Hatred is building up because of your uncontrolled anger. And everyone else just has to deal with it. This is just how I am. There is a cost. How many of you would agree from your own life that you found in Proverbs 15? Listen to this, 15, 18. A hot-tempered person stirs up conflict. How many of you agree with that? How many of you agree with a hot temper stirs up conflict? That there's always going to be some type of tension within the home. Proverbs 14, 17. People with hot tempers do foolish things. So Solomon the wise is telling us your hot temper has so many things over and over. Maybe, maybe he was dealing with anger that he understood what it was doing. The foolish things. How many of you from your anger you do impulsive things? You go and you're like, that's it. I'm going to go tell them. And you're like, why did I open my mouth? I'm going to go tell them off. They need to know. And you go and you, and then you've lost a job. <laughs> you've lost a, a, a friendship. You've lost because of your anger. So what is it that you lose? You lose your reputation. You lose the respect of others around you when you cannot manage your anger. You can lose your job, like I said. You can lose a sale if you're a salesperson. You can lose the love of your family. You lose the reputation. Your body, you know that your body was not, desired, was not designed to handle anger some of the ways that we do. And actually, you can ask a lot of doctors out there that a lot of the, the physical stress that is going on in people's life is what's causing their physical sickness. That's why they have all kinds of um, uh, like stomach issues and why? Because of this anger that is like boiling up inside. Now think about the way that maybe your anger has caused you to lose your reputation with your children. 
your children. Your parents are, 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 your kids are thinking about to their parents that like, sure, I'm going to obey you, but what's happening now? I don't care about you. Like, I'm not going to share with you anymore. I'm not going to talk because you're not a wise person. Because of your anger and because of what you've done to our home, that's it. I'm going to shut down. It's not so much what you eat that is causing you unhealth, but it's what's eating at you. It's what you, what's, you're allowing to develop up in your heart. So we need to remember the cost whenever we're tempted to lose our temper. I want you to think about the times when a parent learns to scare their kids. We scare our kids. Really? You want to see what's going to happen if you disobey me? We scare them. And we get them to obey us by fear. And you're right. They obey us temporarily. Yeah, they'll be quiet. You tell them, let me show you what's going to happen if you don't listen to me. I'm going to do one, two, and three, four. And then what? What happens on the inside to your children? They shut down. They disconnect. They build anger. You lose your reputation. You lose your reputation. Be careful of that. You see, in the long run, there's always three price tags to anger. The first one is more anger. When people get angry at you, when people get angry at you, what happens? Do you want to hang out with them? No. You get angry at them. You just get, they, when they're angry at you, you get angry at them. So anger produces more anger. Next thing is, it produces apathy. Or I should say even apathy is this, this concept of, well, I can't please them. I can't please my parents anyways. Like, no matter what I do, I can never please them. Think about your friendships. Think about some of the people in your life that they think, no matter what I do, I can never please them. And so what happens? Apathy. I'm going to stop making an effort. I've had spouses come and complain. They say, my, my, my husband is, is not trying anymore. You know why? Because you make them feel that they're never, ever, ever going to change. You make them feel that they've made no advancement in this struggle of trying to be at peace with you. So once again, more anger, apathy, and then alienation. To be alienated, the relationship is broken. You get the short-term obedience from your anger, but nothing destroys relationships faster than anger. Next thing, reflect before reacting. In other words, think before you speak. I'm going, to ask, I'm going to give you guys some questions that you can ask yourself, but put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in gear. Start thinking, before I say this, how should I say it? Well, I'll give you some, some steps. Listen to what St. John Climacus says. The first step toward freedom from anger is to keep the lips silent when the heart is stirred to keep the lips silent when the heart is stirred the next to keep thoughts silent when the soul is upset the last is to be totally calm when unclean winds are blowing look at the wisdom in the strugglers of the desert is that it says when the soul is upset keep your thoughts silent when inside the soul is, is disturbed, your inner being is disturbed, it says, any thought that's coming, just shush them. Because what's going to happen with this is this downward cycle of negativity and pain and anger, and the anger is going to get worse and worse. All right. Something you have to understand is that if you hold on to anger... Okay, if you hold on to anger, it's going to turn to resentment. But before that, before that, Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool vents all his feelings. A fool vents all of his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. I read that earlier. One of the greatest tools for anger management is to delay. Just wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Delay your anger. Now, some of those people, or, or, or delay your reaction, but not the way that some of us would do in our houses. You know what? I'm going to speak to you at Christmas. Like, 
Who's going to pick up the kids tomorrow from school? Okay, like, can we, can, we, can we deal with this? You should delay your anger. And I've said this before, but you should set an appointment for when we're going to speak about this. If I'm angry and I'm boiling, sometimes I tell this to Sherry. Like, no, we're going to talk about this now. Sherry, if I talk right now, I'm going to blow. Well, the Bible says that you shouldn't let the sun go down on your anger. All right, I'm going to let it out right now, and you're going to see why I was delaying my anger. And then I go, and we say hurtful things, and we start getting angry. I start pouring it out. Delay your anger. It's okay to say, you know what, honey? This is not the right time to talk about it. Well, what are we going to do? Which side of the marriage is saying that? What are we going to do? It's probably not the man, okay? <laughs> He's like, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm going to sleep, and we'll talk about this another time. Sometimes we need to delay, but don't delay past 24 hours. Be careful not to delay past 24 hours. Otherwise, like I said, we're going to start resenting. One of the Proverbs says, A stupid, a foolish man gives free reign to his anger, but a wise man waits and lets it grow cool. Once again, a foolish man gives free reign to his anger, but a wise man waits and lets it grow cool. So delay is a great remedy. Have you noticed that you can't put your foot in your mouth when it's, when it's closed? You can't regret, Abuna talked about this last week, you can't regret what you say when you shut your mouth sometimes. Listen to this, actually, found out about how much we speak, actually, in a day. The average male speaks 25,000 words a day. <laughs> Should I say it? Okay. The, the average female speaks 900,000... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> The average female speaks 30,000 words a day, which is why when men come home from work, they're done with their words and the woman has another 5,000 to go, okay? She's got to get them out. <laughs> She's got to get these words out. Be careful. When we speak too much, when we can silence ourselves, sometimes it's, it, you, can, you can control I read a funny joke. It says, that's when a guy comes home at night from work. And then he says, there was a person talking to a guy one time and asked, does it bother you that your wife always has the last word? He said, no, I'm just glad when she gets to it. <laughs> when she gets to the last word, we're all happy here, okay? She got it off her chest, we're good. This is, don't, don't, Abuna, this is how you are, okay? Don't, don't, like, Abuna, this is how you are. Everybody knows Okay, so, so this is something we have to worry about, this concept of, like I said, if you hold on to anger, it turns also to resentment. Ask yourselves what to do while you are reflecting. Why am I angry? It's a good question. Ask yourself, what is making me so upset right now? What do I really want? What do I really want out of this argument? Be careful that when you're expressing your anger, if you actually realize what your intention is, a lot of the time, it's to hurt the person in front of me. Even if it's somebody I love, I want to stick it to them. I want them to know that they're the worst person, that they are the ones that are making us miserable. And so... My goal is not to get peace to be built or to make change. My goal is actually to hurt them. And this is what our anger is doing. This is what our anger is doing. I want us to think about three things that cause our anger. First one is the first thing that causes you to get angry is hurt. When you're hurt. Physically hurt, emotionally hurt, when you get wounded, the natural human response is, is, when you get hurt, is to get angry. If I'm out nailing into some wood and I hit my thumb, I'm going to get angry, okay? Next thing is, the second thing that causes you to get angry is frustration. Frustration is when you get irritated and you're like hindered towards your goal. When you're forced to wait for something, like in traffic, you get frustrated. Listen to this beautiful story 
of the desert. It's when you feel, frustration is caused when you feel like you can't control something. A brother was restless in his community, and he was often irritated. So he told his spiritual father, I will go and live somewhere by myself. I will not be able to talk or listen to anyone, and so I shall be at peace, and my passionate anger will cease. Listen to this. He went out and lived alone in a cave, but one day he filled his jug with water and put it on the ground. Suddenly, it happened to fall over. He filled it again, and again it fell. This happened a third time. In a rage, he snatched up the jug and smashed it. Coming to his senses, he knew that the demon of anger had mocked him. And he said, here I am by myself and he has beaten me. I will return to the community. Wherever you live, you need effort and patience and above all, God's help. So he got up and went back. It's a beautiful story about this, this monk that's saying, I can't deal with these people. And how many of us do that? We isolate when we can't deal with the people in our lives. We start to go, we isolate. I don't want to deal with anyone. Let me just go to my little shell or my little cocoon and stay away from everybody else. And you're thinking that everybody else is the problem. Well, this monk goes to the cave and his jar just tips over. And he picks it up. And then his jar tips over a second time. Third time he picks it up and he smashes it. He realizes the, the issue is me, is me not knowing how to process and deal with my anger. The more out of control you feel, the more angry you're going to be. High control people, people that like to control, are high angry people. Because when things get out of your ability to grip, it creates this, this frustration. and You feel out of control. Any parents know that feeling when you have a, a crying baby. Right? You go and they say, you should shush the baby. You should feed the baby. You should swaddle the baby. You should swing the baby. And the baby is still crying. I can't control this. What does that do? It causes this great anger within you and frustration. The third thing is, the third cause of anger is fear. The third cause of anger is fear. This is whenever you feel threatened. Or you feel trapped in a situation. You feel attacked or you feel afraid. Anger and insecurity always go together. So when you feel insecure, it creates this inner anger. And you base your feelings about yourself and what others think about you. This, this concept of how people are, you know, this insecurity. You're going to get angry all the time. Because you're at, at some point, if you start to Expect people to fill all your needs and then you feel like insecure that people aren't caring about me or people are, all of a sudden you have all this fear that nobody's going to love me. It's going to create anger within. I also want you to think about how sympathetic are you with people when they get angry? How sympathetic are you with people that get angry or get angry at you? You know, if somebody gets angry at me, my natural reaction is to do what? To get defensive. Well, that's because you left out the whatever last night. Or because you, and we start to get defensive. And so, believe it or not, how do you deal with people that are angry with you? It's a really, really hard thing because sometimes, unfortunately, we cause anger in others. And I have to figure out, I need to start asking myself, am I listening at maybe what I've done? to create this anger within other people? How have I provoked them? Can I listen to their thoughts? When somebody says, I was hurt by you, maybe you need to say, okay, let me think about that. Let me think about what I've been doing. Maybe something I need to say is, let me just think about what I'm doing. The goal is not to say, well, you're just an angry person. You could be provoking someone to anger. So we're telling everybody to control their anger, but you're pushing somebody's buttons over and over and over again and that person, you're leading them to sin, believe it or not. If, if you're the one pressing the buttons and everyone else is getting angry, stop back and say, what am I doing? What unhealthy in my heart is causing this person to be angry? The Bible makes it very clear. Psalm 141 Verse 3, what should we do when we're dealing with people that are, that are angry? Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. 
Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let me put a guard over my mouth and say, help me to listen to the situation. All right. Next, I need to release my anger appropriately. Appropriately. Like we said, anger is not a sin, but how we deal with it is, is the secret. And the Bible says, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. It's all about how you release it. Psalm 15.1 says this. A gentle answer. Look at these, these beautiful Proverbs. Proverbs 15, sorry. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. This is where the delay comes in. Okay. I need to speak, and I need to express what I'm feeling, but the Bible tells us a gentle answer. Correct? The Bible, even St. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, I believe he says, correct with the spirit of gentleness. People in authority, sometimes when we correct uh, um, somebody that works for me, or somebody, my Sunday school students, or I'm correcting my child, do it with a spirit of gentleness To restore. The goal is to restore, not to hurt. So there's all these different ways that the world teaches us to deal with our anger. And then there's God's ways. First thing that the world is telling us is to suppress it, right? The Bible tells you, uh, uh, or sorry, the the world tells you like, um, you're like, you have to, I'm sorry, you're you're not supposed to suppress it, okay? You don't suppress it. What's the best? You don't suppress it. What does it mean to suppress it? It means keep it in, to keep it inside. It's when you stuff it inside and you store it up inside. It's like taking a Coke bottle and shaking it up, and then you suppress it. No, we got to figure out how to do that. Second thing you don't do is you don't repress it. The first one is first one is suppress it, second one is repress it. Meaning, I'm not angry. How many times have you been in the middle of an argument? You're yelling at your or you're you're discussing with your friend, your parent, your spouse. I'm not angry, you're angry. No, you're angry. You're, you're, you are repressing it. You're pretending like you're not angry. You have to understand that you cannot repress it. It means denying it. It means saying, you know, that pretending like I'm not ticked off. They say repressed anger ends up in depression. So be careful not to repress it. Let me give you a whole lot of marriage counseling in two words. Okay. Grow up. We need to be mature. We need to be mature. We need to know how to... Like the number one cause for marriage is not incompatibility, okay? It's not incompatibility. I don't believe that incompatibility is the issue because any two people are different. We have different backgrounds, we have different families, we have different socioeconomic statuses, sometimes we come from different countries, we come from all kinds of different backgrounds. What should I do? We're just not compatible. No, it needs some self-denial. Anybody who is willing to work on themselves. See, it's not incompatible. It's immaturity. They're willing. They're not willing to be loving. They think more of themselves. If you're willing to grow, if you are willing to grow with someone, okay, we can't say we're not compatible with each other. No, we can grow and we can learn how to overcome the self. I'll tell you, the greatest way to become like Christ is believe it or not, in, in, in relationships or a marriage relationship because you are growing this inner tension. You're learning how to love when it's hard to love. God is growing patience. God is growing endurance and long-suffering. The key is not to run away from that. The, the key is to grow from these situations. Are you growing through your relationships? Now, sometimes there's a level of toxicity. Toxicity is a different thing. Be careful of when something is toxic Versus just two people are just arguing and they're different. 
We have to identify when something is toxic, and this came up in a lot of the discussions in our community groups. Be careful of toxicity. That's not what I'm referring. That's a little bit extreme situation. Third thing is that you don't do is you don't express it in an inappropriate way. You're saying, am I not, am I not, supposed, to, uh, am I not supposed to express? No. You're not supposed to express it in an inappropriate way. Sometimes we express with sarcasm, right? We, do, we start acting sarcastically to express my anger. Or if you are not a sarcastic, some of you guys have like the black belt in sarcasm, right? You are like everything you say is sarcastic and you know how to keep on being sarcastic. Just give these cheap shots through your sarcasm. But the other person who's not sarcastic starts to manipulate and lead people into being manipulated. Right? That person's motto is don't get mad, but get even. But God tells us that we need to confess it. The best way to deal with your anger is to confess it. Let it out to God. If you have anger, sometimes I hear people, they say, I go to my room and I just scream at God. I cry and I shout and I let it all out to God and say, God, I can't do this anymore. Because this anger makes me want to hurt the person in front of me with my words, with my sarcasm, with my cold shoulder. And so I need to go and I need to cry before the Lord. And I need to say, God, I need your help. This is not, there's no one, two, three. It is a calling upon God to say, Lord, I need your help. And we're going to find out how that is. We have to confess it and say, Lord, I'm scared. I feel insecure. I'm hurt. This is the key to permanent long-term change. There's ways to deal with it in the moment, right? A lot of the factors that I'm giving you are things to do in the moment. But then what about forever? Like, I'm an angry person, and I was good once, I was good twice, maybe three times I'll, I'll remember these things. But later on, I need to figure out how do I really change? And this is why the desert is the greatest example. And that's why orthodoxy has given us the, the, the solution. That's why you thank God that you are taught to fast 210 days a year, right? Because you are taught that I'm constantly suppressing the self and the ego. All of this struggle, all of this self-denial, all of this intensity in the orthodox church is the only way. Because the Bible has taught us that you have this nature inside of you. It's called the old man. The old man. Okay? This old man, I need to, I need to what? Break him down. Because my ego says, get revenge. Let them know. Get back at them. That's the self. And that's why when you read the desert and the extreme things that they did to overcome their selves... They found the secret. You say, Abuna, am I supposed to walk around with a stone in my mouth for three years? You can bite your tongue if it's easier. You want to bite your tongue? Go ahead. But like, am I telling you to walk around? But I'm telling you to understand how I need to like really stop the ego from doing what it does to hurt others. Next, you repattern your mind. Listen to what Romans 12, 2 says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, angered response is a learned response. You've learned this. You've learned the way that you do it. That's why we tell people with habits, we say, your coping mechanism is with whatever stress it is, is to smoke a cigarette. Find another pattern, right? If every time you go to drinking when you're angry, okay, that's how you deal with your anger. There's got to be another way. So repattern your mind that when I get angry, I don't drink, I take a walk, I read the Bible, I pray some Psalms, I delay my words, okay? So we need to reframe your mind. This comes in all of the different things that now when I look at a, a woman, I automatically think lustfully, okay, so I should just control my lusts. No, I want the Lord to change my mind. To renew my mind to see this as God's creature. That this is God's daughter. 
that my mind now thinks in a different way. Yes, the fathers have taught us how to do that. Repattern your mind through the Word of God, through the practicing of the spiritual life that we have taught in our church. So the behavior of the world is to repress, express, and suppress. But we can't copy the ways of the world. St. John Climacus says this, As with the appearance of light, darkness retreats. So at the fragrance of humility, all anger and bitterness vanishes. Practice humility. By the way, humility is pursued. It's not just something that you, like, if it comes to me, if a humble thought comes to me, great. If not, then sorry. No, no. Humility is something that I pursue. I go after opportunities to be humble. Opportunities to take the lower place. Opportunities to be the servant in the situation. Opportunities to say sorry. Opportunities to go and, and carry some burden that I don't want somebody else to carry. Be careful of thinking that one day I will just be humble. It's pursued. In your marriages, you have to try to be humble. You have to think, how can I be humble? How can I ask God for grace to step on the self? Rely on God's grace. Listen to this. What is it? Wrath is a reminder of hidden hatred. That is to say, remembrance of wrongs. When you remember somebody's wrongs, when you keep on recollecting the wrongs in people that people have done to you, wrath is a desire for the injury of the one who has provoked you. Irascibility is the untimely blazing up of the heart. Bitterness is a movement of displeasure seated in the soul. Listen to this. Anger is an easily changeable movement of one's disposition and disfiguration of the soul. When your soul is, is disfigured, when, you're, when you are bitter, it says anger is an easily changeable movement. Connecting with the grace of the Holy Spirit, when you are standing before God, you are filling with the means of grace, taking communion. Take communion often. I know some people, they, they, they do it basic, like either as a routine. You cannot overcome the passions without Holy Communion. Okay? And practicing the virtues. Once again, let's, wrath, or like al ghadab right, is, is a reminder of hidden hatred. You have something hiding inside of you. It's remembering somebody's wrongs. It's a desire for the injury of the one who has provoked you. It's a movement. Bitterness is a movement of displeasure seated in the soul. Don't recollect the wrongs. Don't re recollect what other people do to you. Listen to Romans 15, 5. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Jesus Christ had. I will not be able to overcome anger unless I am trying to become like Christ and pursuing this connection with Christ. How much do you pray? I can tell you how you're going to deal with your anger. How much are you on your knees? How much are you fasting for this? How much are you self-aware? How much are you processing, okay, I'm doing this over and over again with my wife and my children and my friends and my coworkers and my... Are you processing? Are you trying to really invite light in these dark places in my life? Last thing. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Out of the abundance of the mouth, sorry, out of the abundance of the heart, what's inside the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of you is what's in the heart. It's an awareness of yourself. When all this stuff is coming back, it's not because everyone else stinks. Everyone else is annoying. Sometimes when I hear like my kids, and this person is annoying, this person is annoying, I'm like, you think maybe you're the annoying one? Is it possible? Because you drive me crazy all day. Like, is it possible that you're the annoying one? Sometimes I need to figure out what's inside of my heart. Out of the abundance of the heart is what comes out of the mouth. That's what's inside your heart. That we need God to heal. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray.